Hey there, welcome to the Ryan Kingsline Show. My name's Ryan Kingsline, and in this podcast, we interview amazing artists, creatives, and creators to find out how they tick and how they got where they are today. So sit back, relax. I look forward to sharing their journey with you. All right, guys, welcome. I have Andrew Hodgins with me here. And uh, Andrew, man, I'm really excited to talk to you. There's a couple of things I want to talk about right off the bat. Number one, if you guys are listening to this, I'm going to occasionally we'll reference things that are on the screen. And so you can always head over to GameArtInstitute.com, go to the podcast, or go to the blog, and, and you can just find Andrew's there where we'll have the screen for you. But I also want to make sure you know is where to find Andrew. So we're going to be talking mostly about his art station. So it's artstation.com forward slash Andrew Hodgson. Am I saying that right? Yeah, it's Hodgson. Yep. So H-O-D-G-S-O-N. And I'm, I want you to know that right off the bat, everybody who's here listening, because I really want you guys to go to the blog section. And in there, there's a lot of great stuff, but the one specifically is the uh, blog post about how I got here, part one. And that's kind of what I would really, if you're down for it, Andrew, I'd love to just unpack that because it's kind of, as you kind of um, alluded to, it's the untold story of the effects. (laughs) Yeah. Before we do that, why don't we just show everybody what a badass you are? So where are you working right now? Uh, Industrial Light Magic at the moment. Cool. Which What's like some of the films that you've worked on? I've worked on Star Wars Episode Eight. Solo, Avengers Infinity War, Guardians of the Galaxy, Transformers, most of the, the big IPs. Yeah. So we're not you're not messing around. No. <laughs> <laughs> you're you're, yeah. you're in it to win it. You know, you've yeah, you've definitely. got that. All right. But it's not always been like this. No. Because I was looking at your um at the resume and all that stuff. Two thousand eleven you graduate from school. Your first job is what, two thousand thirteen? Yeah. It was at and, uh, NPC as a runner. Yes. So your first job was MPC as a runner. So you're not in the arts yet. You want to explain what runners are? So uh, a runner is a pretty big thing in London. What it is, mm-hmm. it's like a, um, they literally do the running around for the studio. They'll do things like serving clients coffee. They'll be cleaning kitchens. Like a lot of the VFX studios are quite close to each other. So they'll be running hard drives amongst the studios. If uh, like another studio needs assets from NPC, they would run mm-hmm. like physically run the drives over to another company. Mm-hmm. So that's pretty much what a runner does. Awesome. But like they're not really a thing in Vancouver, I've noticed. I've just seen them in London so far. It's a cultural thing, huh? Mm. There's things like render wranglers and you know, even I think sometimes some junior positions where you're just dealing with file management, not even art, you know, yeah. there's there's all that that stuff can happen. But when you went to school, you graduated two thousand eleven, had you studied three D or no? So I originally studied graphic design. I never really knew what I wanted to do when I was studying. I just did mm-hmm. like graphic design because it's kind of just a generic design course. I always knew I wanted to do something arty. Yeah. But uh, so what happened was I came across a 3D unit in my graphic design course. Like it was 3D for graphic design. It wasn't, we didn't deal with proper topology. We didn't use the standard industry software. We used Cinema 4D. Mm-hmm. So it pretty much was 3D for graphic design. But when I first saw this i was like why would i do this i don't enjoy this at all and i almost i almost failed the course actually because um i just i just wasn't interested in doing the subject Mm -hmm. but then since i was gonna fail well fail since i wasn't i was falling behind i was like okay cool i need to actually put effort in and i started staying late to get the 3d work done and i realized how much i actually ended up enjoying it so that was in my second year but then, yeah, I finished the second year. I still didn't really know what I wanted to do. But then the third year came around and I was like, oh, actually, this 3D thing is really cool. And then I ended up tweaking all my final year like courses into 3D, which was it's pretty cool because like I put in so much extra effort during my second year that the lecturers knew that I was actually serious about this. So the, yeah. the lecturers were willing to bend the curriculum to suit me, which was very cool. So it's funny because at the end of my third year, there was a graphic design course, right? So everyone has all these like logos and business cards and talking about fonts and stuff like that. And then my mm-hmm. graduation, I had a battleship sailing through an ocean. Like it's, it's completely different to everyone else. So I had to kind of tweet my schooling to myself. But after that, I realized actually, wait, this isn't actually how professionals work. It was purely just, just I don't know, I was experimenting, I guess, at the time. Mm-hmm. 
so yeah after i graduated i was like okay cool going into film sounds like it'd be a cool thing so i took a year off and i taught myself how to do proper topology and stuff like that and then the first job is as a runner how long did it take you to actually score that job uh, your first art job after that so i was living in australia at this time in perth huh? and there's no vfx industry in perth at all i spent a year working on my portfolio and eventually i finished my portfolio and i looked online at every single possible studio i could possibly find even the most random obscure thing in any random country so i got a list of 90 studios and i sent my portfolio to not all of them and i heard back from none of them <laughs> like literally not a single studio i was like since you've been in the industry have you heard that that's more common or less common well i can i can understand why it's so hard to get in Yeah, like it's that. pretty common in my experience. You know, people send out resumes and in the beginning, you know, you just hear nothing. It's crickets. Exactly. Because that's the thing, like so these studios are receiving so many resumes. Yeah. And especially when you're in like I was in Perth, no company is going to fly a, a someone out with no experience. Right. Unless so, you're like, you know, just there's just something that's just badass and Yeah, exactly. Like, Unless like Vitaly Bulgarov was yeah, exactly. flown, you know. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I redid my entire portfolio in in three months. Like mm -hmm. literally the entire thing, and I sent it to 130 studios this time. Wow! And I I heard back from none of them again. I was like, oh, okay, this this isn't really working. Tell me about how that felt though, because I you know you allude to this in the blog post, and I think this this is the untold story. I mean, it's easy at this point to be like, shit, I suck. <laughs> I am not going to make it. Or you can just be like, I don't know what's missing. I don't know what's wrong, and nobody will tell me. And I've mm. I've talked to people that you know it's, they're resentful. Yeah. Why is nobody helping me? I did feel that for some time. I did feel pretty bad about mm -hmm. it. Obviously, I mean, it just felt like it would be impossible to get in. Totally. But um, I knew the fact that I was in Perth. It just meant that it was just going to be so much harder. So what I decided to do was, well, firstly, I decided, okay, I don't care what it takes. I'm going to get into the industry. So what I was going to do was I was going to move myself to one of the main VFX hubs mm -hmm. and. So since I'm Australian, I could go to maybe Sydney or something like that. But I also have a British passport, actually. And I was Lovely. like, if I'm going to leave Perth, I might as well just go big, go all out. So that's why I picked London. My original plan was I would move myself to London and I would, I don't know, work in a bar or something like that. Just do yeah. anything just to be in like around the VFX studios. And I would just constantly knock on their doors and hand out CVs until I eventually got in. I was, How old were you at this point? I was 23. And I'd never lived out of home at this point either. Were your parents like funding this adventure as well? Yeah, my parents did fly me there, which I'm eternally grateful for my parents for looking after me as I was self-teaching and stuff like that. Totally, yeah. Mine too. <laughs> But yeah, I, that's the thing. I just, I just had to get in. So... I also booked an exact one-year date return flight. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I had no, I, I pretty much forced myself. I have no choice, but I have to stay there for exactly one year to make it work. Yeah. And if I do get in, cool. It means I just come back for a holiday in one year time, which is, is which is what ended up happening. That's but, nice. Uh, <laughs> how long did it take? Would ha you get there? And oh, it's crazy. It took one week. <laughs> yeah, that is crazy. I know it, it was mind blowing. When I booked the flight, it was pretty quick. Like it was like in a few weeks from now, pretty much. Oh, mm -hmm. I'm just going to go there. Just take a suitcase, and go. And when I got there, I had I had one week in a hotel. I had no, obviously, no job. I didn't have any family. Any, I didn't really know anyone there. It was just like this is the thing. Like, sure, it it made me feel bad that no one was going to pick me up. But when you put yourself in such a situation like that, you you have no choice. You can't feel sorry for yourself. You have to make this work. So as soon as I got there, I just hit the ground running, looking for a place. And it took one week, which is a surprising thing. It was, yeah, I had no idea my life would go that way, to be completely honest. I, I think it has, a, a, it, it speaks a lot to the fact, one of my students and I were talking about this a bit ago, and there's a Norwegian gamer event. And he was like, should I go? Should I not? Is it worth the ticket? Is it not worth the ticket? But this really speaks to how, you know, A lot can happen online, but it's accelerated when you're in there meeting somebody, you're seeing, you guys are talking, there's a personal connection, you know, that changes things. Yeah, definitely. 
So what did you eat? Like, were you doing top ramen? I, you know, cause I'm always fascinated by this. Oh, I ate man. so many pot pies. I can't actually go down the frozen food aisle to this day. Uh, uh, so living in London is really hard. Like, yeah, <laughs> so I, was, I was, what's that? I said, I've spent time there. It is pricey. Yeah, definitely. Especially like when you're starting your career there. Mm. So I would do things like buy a loaf of bread and make ham and cheese sandwiches and just like <laughs> freeze, freeze some of the sandwiches and just eat that over time. <laughs> stuff like that it was hard because i'd never lived out of home before either so i never i didn't know how to cook or anything really all right so it took a week <laughs> you get a job and it's not like the highest paying job i think you said it's the lowest paying job so the, the way i got in i didn't even have to knock on doors like it was it was really really random what happened so when i first got there i contacted a guy who i'd emailed a year before and he's an Australian VFX artist at, at Double Negative at the time. And mm -hmm. he told me if I ever come by London, we should grab a drink. So one year later, I arrive in London, email him, hey, I'm in London. So uh, yeah, I caught up with him for lunch and then hung out with him for the rest of the day. So this was like maybe three days into being in London. Yeah. And then we caught up with him for dinner. And he invited, we just happened to be in this in the area of some of his friends. And he just invited them along. One of them was a lighting supervisor at MPC, and one of them was in HR at MPC. So this is how Man, I actually that's like, in. That's like the friend lottery there. Yeah, I know, right? The funny <laughs> thing was like, yeah, my friend was like, oh, I, I didn't plan for anything to happen. It was purely because we happened to be in the area and they were free, so we grabbed dinner. But I, I told them like, you know, I'd literally arrived in the country several days ago. I got nothing set up. I'm trying to get into VFX. And the woman was like, well, would you be interested in being a runner? That there might be a spot opening for you. I'm not for you, but in general. I was like, yeah, definitely. So I, I gave her my contacts. And then the next day, I sat across the road from MPC in a Starbucks, <laughs> just refreshing my iPad for hours. <laughs> and I just sat there. And then eventually, I got an email from MPC saying, hey, we got your contact. Like, do you want to have a chat? And I just responded, yeah, I'm across the road right now. I'm, we can do it now. And then they're like, okay, sure, why not? Let's have a chat. So I walked in and they're like, yeah, do you want to be a runner? I was like, yep, cool, come back next week. And I was like, holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. Like, I, It's so mind-blowing even to this day thinking about how different my life would be if that friend didn't meet me. How'd you meet this friend? So he was actually, he was the nephew of one of the lecturers of where I studied. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so she just gave me his contact and I just emailed him. He doesn't work in modeling. He was an effects artist. Yeah. But yeah, it was just a contact, another Australian there. And that uh, works. yeah, that's how I got into being a runner. Oh, it was, it was the best day of my life. It was, it was crazy. Like I'd moved across the planet by myself with just a goal. And well, the goal's not finished yet, but you know, we're off to a good start. All right. So you get the job, but. This isn't the end of the story, right? I mean, there's some tragedy. There's some difficulty after this. <laughs> yeah, so um, I'm in now as a runner, and it's so funny. So most people usually don't they don't really enjoy running. It's just, mm -hmm. you know, it's not the funnest job. But I, I was so excited to be in the studio. Like, I, I had always dreamed of work. Well, not always dreamed, but, you know, since I'd gotten, was thinking getting to film, I always wanted to get into a company like NBC. And now I'm in here, I'm looking around at all the everyone's monitors looking at all this cool movie stuff happening they were working on godzilla at the time so that was really cool and yeah i was the most enthusiastic runner they've ever seen i would just turn up like an hour early stay extra time just yeah but um yeah i obviously want to be a modeler not a runner so i went straight to the asset department and i showed them my portfolio and i was like yeah, i want to want to be a modeler and they looked at my reel and they're like okay cool your, your work isn't bad but unfortunately, we can't ever hire you in the future as a junior modeler because we send more of our junior work to another, like another NPC office now. And I was like, ah, oh, damn. It, had, it felt like I'd walked straight in, you know, got the step through the door and just walked straight into a wall. It was just like, yeah, it was obviously hard. But, you know, I was like, okay, cool. What, what can I do next? So what I did was I would sit in the asset room in my spare time and just work on like personal work or I would do training stuff like that and I started talking to the artists and my rule I made up was like I have to be the last person in the room every single 
night. Mm. It was like all I cared about was being was being seen. So sometimes I'd be in the studio, maybe fifteen hours, something crazy like that. Of course, like I was just doing personal work and stuff like that. But the main point was as long as people consistently see me. And then after three months of doing that, something popped up. They needed artists immediately, and who else has been sitting in front of them every single day for three months? And they're like, okay, fine, we'll we'll give you a shot, and that's it. So they said they can't hire you. Yeah. But you stay there. You show up every day, and then they suddenly need you. Yeah. So I mean, so what happens with like film in general is so inconsistent. Like, mm-hmm. so many projects will be like, okay, we only need maybe five modelers. On this film, and right. then maybe three months in, another VFX studio can't do their work, and then it gets sent to a different company, like purely because it's too much work or the show grows, and then they suddenly need many people. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. it's very standard for studios to constantly go up and down. So they did tell me they wouldn't be able to hire me, but then suddenly a big influx of work came in, and they did desperately need to hire people, and then. I was sitting right there, so like, okay, fine, we'll we'll give you a shot, and that was that was the start of it. What well, what was the uh, project? Can you say? Not the, I mean the uh, the thing that you had to make. The project. It was a uh, guidance of the galaxy. What was the object you had to? They needed help with. Oh no, they just needed help with the show. Yeah. So modeling um, something or? Yeah, it was just modeling stuff. Like usually, since it was my first job, it was you know really basic stuff like basic weapons or assisting other artists, but. Yeah. Eventually, I just worked so much and so fast that they ended up starting to give me more and more work. Pretty much, I like this rule that you have to be the last person so that they see you. Like it's yeah. almost, and, and don't take this the wrong way, but it's almost like the um, like the seven habits of successful or people or something like that. I don't know why I'm blanking at it, but it's like there are these rules that we have in life that if we do these, you know, it increases our chances. Like I'll tell yeah. you one of my rules here in a moment. But is there any of these? rules other rules that kind of helped you get where you are that you think people kind of miss and what's on my mind here is a lot of time artists think well you know it's all about the art yeah but no Mm. i think even throughout my whole career i've always been very vocal about what i want like Mm -hmm. the fact that my entire portfolio is spaceships and robots is because i really push towards that so I think that's one of the main things that helped with my, I guess, you know, quotes, success was I knew what I wanted and I pushed for it. Like mm. getting into the VFX industry, I was like, I don't care what it takes. I'm going to get in. And then even though they tell me, oh, sorry, we can't hire you as a modeler. I'm like, okay, I'm going to keep pushing until I can get into being a modeler. And things always just seem to work out. Like if you keep pushing for something, it might not work out how you expect but things have always seemed to work out for me because I'm constantly pushing towards them. That makes sense. Persistence, stay in it. Definitely. I like that. Focus on what you want because it sounds like it's going to motivate you. Yeah, definitely. A lot of times it, it probably won't work out how you expected. Yeah. But I always like that. What's that quote? Like successful people don't make the right decisions. They make their decisions right. I think <laughs> that pretty much sums it up. I like that. That's a good one for us. I remember, you know, I'm somebody, I have a hard time kind of putting myself out there, which might seem odd because I, I do a lot of emailing and videos, but uh, I'm really shy and very internal. And I remember I was trying to battle this once and I did this, <laughs> it's a little funny, a little weird to say, but I'm going to see if you got something embarrassing too, like this. But I was, you know, I was, God, I was in some um, call center and I was trying to get myself to be more out there. And so the way I chose to get myself more out there is I was like, I was going to think about all the things that I deserve, right? Like I deserve X, Y, and Z. I deserve, and so I basically went into the handicapped bathroom for like a month straight. Like there was, I would take, I was like, I'm going to pick the biggest bathroom stall there is because I deserve a big bathroom stall, period. End of the story, right? <laughs> you know? right? So there's these weird little things when we're younger, you know, that uh, that we're going through. You know, but how did you get yourself in a position where you were like so willing to just put yourself out there and do what you wanted? Were you just born that way or or what something happened? I don't know, like something like with me, like I've always I've and this, and this is gonna sound weird, but I've always gotten mm-hmm. good at what I wanted, if that mm-hmm. makes sense. Like I just I pick something and I go hundred and fifty percent of it. That pretty much sums up my life. Like say for example, 
I'm almost 30 now and I had never cooked in my life until two months ago like, mm-hmm. at all. So I was like, okay, this, I need to fix this. I'm going to, I need to uh, learn to cook. So I was like, okay, I'd rather pay a professional to teach me how to cook properly. So I signed up for a course and I enjoyed the first two classes so much. I signed up for five other courses immediately after. So, and I just like dropped three grand on this school immediately. I was like, it's, if I do something, it has to be like 120% or not at all. That's just, I guess, how I've been throughout my whole life. I just get super passionate about something. And then not only am I passionate about it, I feel the need to get good at it. So that's a good moment for us to talk and maybe transition to a little bit more the career because you're a hard surface modeler. And so modeling is like, that's a career that's in film, not necessarily in games, because if you're in games, you're more like everybody's modeler or you're an animator of VFX. Uh, so they divide it into character and environment. But if we're, if we're looking at film and we're looking at, um, at your job, you, what are some of the essential things that somebody has to make sure that they can do? Okay. So the main thing, and this is why I always talk about a lot with portfolios is the main yes. thing they need to do is they need to be able to replicate exactly what they've been told to do. So like, this is the main thing. Like a lot of the time people will send me portfolios and they have just made up their own concept. Oh my God, that drives me bananas. <laughs> but the, yeah, the thing is like, okay, so as a, like as a modeler in film, we never make our own concept ever. And if we're very lucky, we might get to modify stuff or problem solve. Like say, for example, we get a concept which is quite painterly in some areas. You can maybe, you know, problem solve that area. But as a modeler in film, we're always making what we've been told to make. And also the, the big thing with film as well is photorealism. Like you have to make it photoreal. So I always suggest people to model from real life and to demonstrate that they can line up images correctly in Maya and then model on top of that perfectly. Because that shows your, you have the eye to not only model every single shape you need to, but you can, you're not cutting corners, which, you know, if you receive someone's personal concept you don't know if they can model correctly or they've cut corners just to you know save time totally how do they demonstrate that in the portfolio you know because i a hundred percent agree i mean especially in film although you have the same in in games but in film i mean you've got concept artists that like they eat breathe this stuff i mean i've worked with dylan cole i've worked with james klein these are our directors production uh, dylan cole's production designer of avatar two three four and five now i mean yeah. why would you want to be a designer this is somebody who lives that and that's <laughs> all that's all he does and he's going to do it better than than we're going to do it exactly but how do we present that does that mean that i go and i model a soup can and i show a picture of a soup can or you know uh, how does this work so is my screen being shared at the moment? It is, yeah. Cool. I did a blog on portfolios, actually. Probably Fantastic. Fine. So this guy here, Zach Boxel, he's a texture artist at ILM London now. So this guy got picked out right out of school. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to show you his reel. I think this guy has the best school demo reel I've seen. So, of course, like all this sort of stuff is very cool. But mm-hmm. um, like he did a group project. But the thing I'm interested in is his presentation. So this stuff. So if I make this full screen, can you see everything? Yes. Cool. I think this is a very good thing to do. And I, I highly suggest people do this. And I'm really surprised that most people don't. So what Zach did is he went to a museum and he took these photos of this helicopter himself so he knows the focal length of the camera. And what he did was he lined the camera up, the cameras up in Maya, and -hmm. then he modeled on top of it. So he's shown he can model exactly what he is meant to do. But also the fact that he's presented it in his demo reel this way shows that I can see he actually has copied it. He's not faking anything. So... Automatically, this is really high points for me mm-hmm. if I'm looking for like a junior. Because, like, sure, someone could make some cool transformer looking thing, but if I needed them to model this basic car, can they do it? You, you don't know. Where Zach has demonstrated here, he can. So, as a junior, you're more likely going to be doing this than whatever the cool spaceship is in reality. I got it. One of the ways that I think about 
that today is a lot of times we think of like, cr- not, not craft, but we're like, you know, I get a lot of people that are like, Hey, I'm going to put figure drawing on a portfolio, or I'm going to put this, or I'm going to put that. Cause they think people want to see art and yep. you know, they're maybe coming from a college, not my students, but you know, they're coming, they're interviewing from my, my school. And they're like, you know, they're coming from a traditional college where there's probably a figure drawing class there's all that kind of stuff. But it's, you know, I always remind them in the interview, this is a business, you know, and you're applying for a job that somebody is going to pay you for. Then they do not care about you at the end of the day. They care about not going bankrupt. I mean, you know, ILM is pretty well done, but motion picture company, you know, you know, companies like that do have real pressures because they have to ramp up, they have to ramp down, they got HR, they got a million different things. And so we talk a lot about triggers and that the most important thing that you can do as an aspiring artist, somebody who wants to get paid for this, is to know what the hiring triggers are yep. and then put those in your portfolio, right? So this sounds like this is exactly one of the hiring triggers. You have to model to camera. I imagine that's how that's phrased. Are there other hiring triggers? I'm just speaking from my own personal thing of what I think is impressive in a reel. Like some other person might think, oh, the cool transformer is real. But yeah, like I said, at the end of the day, most of what we're doing is modeling someone else's design or we're modeling something. Like a lot of the stuff we model also exists in the real world. Like say, for Mm -hmm. example, they might model something on set. So then we need to make a perfect version of that digitally. So obviously you need someone that can line cameras up to the scan and then be able to model on top of that. So we don't ever do our own designs. I mean, I think it's, it's a balance. I think as long as if you can show this sort of stuff and then have some cool like transformer thing you made up, yeah. that's kind of cool to see a creative side as well. But yeah, there's lots of times where I'll see people just do lots of really random, cool, Vitaly looking stuff. Right. But, but we with his it. kit. Yeah, with his kit. <laughs> And just Boolean shapes just for the sake of it, yeah, which have no functional purpose. But we don't really do that most of the time. So that's why I think it's much better to go to a museum. And well, another benefit of going to a museum is, I mean, you get to physically look at this thing in real life. And Mm -hmm. also, like a lot of people that do their own designs, they don't really have the, firstly, they don't really have the artistic eye for shapes. They don't Mm -hmm. really know how to problem solve like say like make something actually look mechanical because that's the thing like when we're building something in a hard surface it doesn't have to technically work but it has to look like it works so if you don't have the background knowledge of what makes something look like it's functional that can really break your design like for example if someone has their own robot design but it doesn't look like the arm can move that kind of automatically dismisses everything so the benefit of building from real life is Firstly, you've got all the information in front of you. You can physically go and look at this thing. You can take as much photo reference as you want. And the benefit of doing that is you're also building your artistic eye for how to problem solve later. So this is why I think it's much better to, for juniors especially, to do real world objects when they're starting. And then once they get into the industry, then they can branch more into doing their own designs. Riley's asking, assuming people are, 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 are doing this exercise, how does one, somebody distinguish themselves above and beyond this fray? If it's all accuracy, how do I make myself stand out? Well, to be honest, this, this thing I'm showing in front of you, yeah. almost no one does it. So this alone actually is what makes people stand out to me. Doing it right. Yeah, doing it correctly. Showing me that you can copy exactly what you're meant to do mm-hmm. is a very big thing for me. That's great. That makes sense. I mentioned this a lot, but one of the people I interviewed for the boot camp was talking about how his um, his teacher told him he had a better chance of getting into the NFL than becoming a character artist in games. Wow, that's, and, that's pretty messed up. Yeah, it was real messed up, right? And we were, you know, we were working through that. And he eventually came into the boot camp, and um, you know, that idea I think is so prevalent, but it comes from the fact that people never do, really, in my view. They very rarely do what they're supposed to be doing to get the job. They just do what they think they should be doing. Yeah. And there's a big gap between what you should be doing and what, what the hell HR wants. So let's talk a little bit, if you don't mind, about the this hiring. You know, because who makes these decisions? How do I know who I'm kind of aiming a portfolio to? Are there artists over there saying, telling, informing HR? Or is HR informed and they know what to look at in terms of the imagery? 
I don't think HR has anything to do with it, really. I mean, mm-hmm. recruiters, for example, they usually get, I mean, this is, I'm pretty sure this still happens, mm-hmm. but like recruiters will get a list of, you know, portfolios and links and they'll send it to the model supervisor and then the model supervisor will look through them and then they make the decision mm-hmm. on who to move forward first. But I mean, a lot of hiring is also based on like recommendation as well. So yeah, it's usually the supervisor, the model soup, for example, that will look at this. Are there anything that you think people do that are big turnoffs in terms of the modeling that just like instantly tell you, uh, this person's amateur, like showing a whole bunch of hard surface ZBrush renders, right? The biggest thing is like, I did this as well. Yeah. Like a lot of people, they will have texturing in their reel, okay. but if their texturing is not as good as their modeling, it pulls everything down. Mm. So I think if you want to be a modeler, just, just show gray models. If you're applying for a modeling position and you just show really nice clay renders with wireframes and then you show, you know, sort of stuff like what's on my screen now, you don't really need to see texturing at all. Also, some people, like presentation is also another big thing. There's no reason why it's just to do like an ambient occlusion basic viewport thing anymore when Keyshot can give you a really nice gray turntable super fast. So I think for modeling at least, you don't even have to see texturing. Just show show that you can model really efficiently and clean. You ever screwed up on the job and had like a real embarrassing thing? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, everyone makes mistakes. Yeah, yeah, me, yeah. Um, I don't know if I can go into any specific examples. <laughs> it's like, yes, but I'm not telling you. <laughs> I don't know if I, I mean, there's, there's plenty of times where I can, I can look at generic, like general things, like there's something might happen where like, because when you're working on a film, there's, you're constantly, like there's, there's so many people working on one thing at once. Even like, say for example, this helicopter, right? Mm-hmm. If this needs to get done really quickly, there could be two people working on this at once, like modeling wise. And then you've got your rig, you've got the rigger on it. You've got, you know, texturized doing their stuff, look dev. You've got all these people working together. So if communication isn't there, you can kind of screw each other over. Mm-hmm. Say for example, if I just, renamed the uh some of the model parts from this helicopter for example and then rigging didn't know and then the rig would break and then bits would be flying off in random obscure directions and like there's that sort of stuff but i mean that stuff's kind of it's not normal in vfx but it is kind of normal if that makes sense yeah how do you guys keep in touch like what kind of communication do you guys use slack do you use like, we're you we use shotgun right now in the studio and then there's um jira is there any um, methods like that that are, you know, you find better than others? I mean, every studio has their own mm-hmm. form of like communication tool. I, I can't even remember what the, <laughs> they're called. But um, yeah, every studio just has their own proprietary communication thing. So you can just message each other directly, you set, you share screenshots, stuff like that. Or you can do like, if you check an asset into the pipeline, you can email out to everyone, just letting them know you've checked in the asset, that sort of stuff. Yeah, I, get, I imagine ILM's probably got their own. Custom. I mean, they build so much custom yeah. there. Every studio has their own custom stuff. It's that's actually yeah one of the cool things. Like when you you go to another studio, you kind of have to learn the new pipeline. How long have you been at ILM? I was at ILM for two years. Yeah. Then I left and went to Method for nine months, and then I've come back to ILM for another eight months. Uh, which studio are you out of? Vancouver. You're in Vancouver. What ILM in Vancouver? Yeah, ILM's got a Vancouver office. Oh, I didn't even know that. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not keeping up on it. So, what do you love about Vancouver? You oh, know, the city itself. There. Right? It is, isn't it? Oh, it's like, have you been to Vancouver? Yeah, I trained so much when I was uh, training ZBrush. I was up at EA almost every month. Oh, really? Awesome. Yeah, yeah I, I love that city. Vancouver reminds me a lot about Australia. Mm-hmm. Like, it's a very chill, comfortable place to live, but it has the VFX industry that obviously Australia doesn't. So. It's kind of the best of both worlds. It's got the VFX industry of London, but it's got the comfortable living of Australia. So that's, yeah, that's why I'm in Vancouver at the moment. Yeah. I'll probably end up staying here, to be honest, I think. Really? Yeah. What makes you want to stay there? Just the... There's lots of studios around, which is obviously a big plus. It's just a very comfortable lifestyle here. Like I, I live in my own one bedroom flat downtown, you know, with a five minute walk to work. Mm. So uh, it's hard to beat that. Like in London... You're paying like two hundred dollars a month for the train, and your rent is ridiculous, and you're always in a house share stuff like that. That makes sense. It is a beautiful city. Mm. 
the fact that we can be at work and uh-huh. then be like, hey, who wants to go snowboard? And then, you know, an hour later, yes. we rent a car and we're snowboarding because the mountain is like 30 minute drive away. Like that sort of stuff is, it's really hard to be. There you go. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That sounds nice. And then the summers have to be just amazing. Yeah, definitely. So along those lines, if somebody's, let's say that we've got somebody who's just like you, you know, in the beginning and like me, you know, just trying, 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 trying. What is a day like? Like, what is life like now? What can we look forward to? What is my life like? Yeah, just paint a picture for us, you know, so people have a sense of this because, you know, like you experienced and you alluded to, you know, in the beginning, it's just, it can be a little gray, like you're never sure what you're going to get. But what does it look like now? You know, you're, you're working in the job, the studio, and then you're coming back in and, you know, you've got friends in the studio, you got friends outside. Yeah, my life is pretty casual at the moment, to be honest. Mm-hmm. Like, because since I'm just doing hard surface the whole time, I'm kind of at the point now where... If I get given a task at work, I don't really need to think too much about it. Like, of course, there's always challenges involved, but yeah. I'm quite comfortable now with my career. You know, I'm quite happy with the type of work I get. You know, ILM itself is quite a comfortable studio to be in. You know, we have a gym, we have good benefits, all that sort of stuff. So, because I'm not also in a leadership position, I'm just a senior modeler. Mm-hmm. So a lot of the time, I usually just get left alone just to do my thing. Like, I'll come in. Just model what I need to throughout the day. Maybe I might do a, a submit. We might have rounds, which is when the uh, supervisors come around and just talk at people's desks and see what's happening or, and just submit some dailies. Yeah, it's it's not too bad, actually. Are you working long hours, like 10 hours, 12 hours? No, at the moment, it's still, it's pretty normal. In assets, it's not, it's not too bad. Like I know like comp and lighting definitely see they definitely have the biggest crunch, but in mm-hmm. assets, it's usually pretty chill. Well, sometimes it can be intense. It depends entirely on the show. Like we can just be working fine, and then suddenly there might be a trailer delivery suddenly, and then yeah. we might have to do some OT for a week or two, something like that. But lately, for me, it's been pretty good. Is it paid overtime or is it, are you salary? It, it is you paid overtime. Oh, in, in Vancouver, Vancouver. It doesn't suck that bad. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> in London, it's not though. So. Uh. Yeah, that it depends on the city. That's another reason why I'm quite happy with Vancouver is because overtime is paid. Yeah, I'd be happy about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh God. Yeah, uh, nice people. Are. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things I think that's um, endemic about this industry is how much moving around we do, and you, there's some moving around that you've done, right? Yeah. So do you do you think it's important that somebody like if they want to be an artist, they they want to be a production artist, let's just say production artist, is it pretty much a necessity to move around? It depends. So like with me, like I did try, I was trying to stay in a studio for about maybe two years. The problem yeah. is if you, if you leave a company and go to another one, you're going to have to prove yourself again, mm-hmm. where if you establish yourself in one studio, you get given better work. So for example, when I started my career at NBC, like a lot of people that also started with me were moving around earlier. They were getting, and the thing is when you leave the studio, when you move studios is when you usually get your pay jump. So a lot of, I had friends which were leaving the company and getting much more money than I was at other studios. But for me personally, at the, especially at the start of my career, which I think is when this is most important, I didn't care about the money. I cared more about building the portfolio and getting the experience first. And then the money comes eventually. I love that. That's a great strategy. Stay, put the time in so that you're getting the work and that worked out for you then. Yeah, definitely. It did take longer for me to get to I guess a salary that I feel is you know a higher salary but mm-hmm. that's the thing I, I did all the hard work at the start and now I'm it's pretty easy for me if that makes sense yeah because like, I built the portfolio first and you so also, what okay. yeah go for it. oh yeah so I was saying yeah, if you, you also build a reputation like if you leave a company too much like you bounce around too much that yeah. also can look bad on your CV because then people will be like well how come this person only stays at companies for three months were they so bad they got let go or can we trust them to be on a project long term? Well, along those lines, isn't film a little bit less stable? Like people get laid off a little bit more often? That is also true. That's definitely an unfortunate thing you'll have to kind of accept if you decide to go into film. We constantly go through ups and downs. Like it's nothing personal. It's just a studio can't keep all these people sitting around if there's no film work. Mm -hmm. But with that sort of thing, like when... Like it's so normal for people to bounce around studios that a lot of the time that if a studio does lay everyone off, another studio might be hiring and then everyone just kind of migrates to the next studio. 
what's the industry like for you right now? Is this is this a good time for somebody to be getting into it? Or are we having a downturn, upturn? I don't know, to be honest. I personally am not too concerned about myself. I feel I've established myself now, so it's okay. If you want to get in the industry, definitely do it. It might be hard, but it's totally worth it if you want to put the time in. What do you tell students when people come to you and they're like, what do I need to do? What do I need to focus on? I mean, we talked about modeling to camera. What else do you tell people that are like, how do I do this? How do I get started? What do you say? Well, the main thing I say is like, you know, work out exactly what you want to do and tailor your work towards it. That's, yeah, you mentioned that if you want to work at Blizzard, tailor it to Blizzard. Yeah, definitely. But like I'll see some some people send me portfolios with like concept stuff, some environment yeah. stuff, some, you know, like you said, figure drawing. And I'll look at their portfolio and I'll be like, what do you want to do? I have no idea. Like you've you kind of just listed, you've kind of just got everything in front of me. I don't know what you want. Mm -hmm. Where if you look at my portfolio, it's entirely spaceships. So it's like, okay, we'll get this guy to do spaceships then. It also gives you like a goal to move towards if you know exactly what you want instead of kind of just like lingering around. Makes sense. So I want to talk about hard surface because it's kind of like the bane of my existence to some extent. <laughs> it's right. so freaking hard, right? For me. <laughs> Like it's easier for me to sculpt naked people by a yeah. long shot than for me to get in and figure out hard surface. So what is it that really, what can I do to get, get better at that? Just do hard surface. I mean, that's pretty much it. Like <laughs> I, 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 I've never done a character in my life. Yeah. Like, one. So I, I'm terrible character art, for example. But if you want to become a good hard surface modeler, I wouldn't like stop looking at people like Vitaly's work. And look at, yeah, like I said, go to a museum and look at how a real car engine looks. Think about, like the main thing that makes hard surface, hard surface is it's functional. Everything hard surface is man-made. So yeah. everything has purpose. So even simply as you're looking around, like you might look at a lamp and see, like see how the structure is made to support this. Like look at how things, because everything in hard surface has a purpose. Just look at how things are put together. Mm -hmm. from the real world. I think that's the biggest thing when it comes to hard surface. So when I was in London, I went to an air show and I saw these US Air Force mechanics in front of all these fighter planes. And I was like, hey, I work in the film industry. Do you mind if I talk to you about the planes? I'm like, sure, no worries. And I just stood there for like an hour pointing at every single little tiny hole on the plane. I was like, what does this do? What's this for? Why is this thing like this? And they just explain everything. So then I took that information. And anytime I work on a plane, I just think back to those things they talked about. Mm -hmm. Like if you look on aircraft, there'll be really tiny, small aerials or little on the backs of wings. Mm -hmm. And it's for when the plane gets struck by lightning, the lightning is redirected around the plane to those aerials. So now when I work on my own personal aircraft, I can just throw the aerials on. And it looks more functional. Mm. That's definitely the biggest thing. Yeah, that's actually one of the things we teach in anatomy, and it's that you have to know it to do it, right? And you right. got to have the words, you know, even if you forget them later, like you don't remember what those things are called. And it sounds like that's what you're talking about. You have to stop trying to Vitaly it, and exactly. you've got to go in and learn the anatomy. Yeah, like Vitaly knows these things. That's why he's able totally. to pull it off, where a lot of the time you'll see people try and imitate concept designers without actually thinking or knowing about why they function. Yeah. And yeah, you're right. Actually, that was a mistake to call it, to say Vitaly it because Vitaly actually is designing robots and all yeah. that. Like, I know this shit. We're just making it up. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, this is when I work on aircraft, like I put like these little aerials. Yeah. And it's just, a, it's just a cool, small little detail, but I have an actual purpose with them, even though this isn't a real aircraft, uh -huh. if that makes sense. Yeah. This is my first ever 3D model that I made in the school. Awesome. This, yeah. And then I rebuilt it seven years later and this is it now. Damn. So when we're looking at this, cause this is kind of exactly what I was getting at. I saw this earlier today and I'm like, okay, so you, you know, he's done his hard surf. And I'm like, if I, if I had to do this, I'd be like, where's the cylinder go? And, um, <laughs> is, there was some great thing. Where's that great thing go? <laughs> like, yeah. So, are you kit bashing this or are you actually like looking at exhaust systems and look and understanding some of this? And then, you know, how, how deep does this go for you? So with this, a lot of it is kind of just made up for fun, but mm -hmm. say for example, 
this is based on the real engine flaps. I literally looked at reference when I built this. Mm-hmm. So like, even now, I still do look at reference if I want to work on something. But because this is just kind of a spaceship for fun, I did make up a lot of the stuff. It sounds like, you know, you look at reference, but you're doing a little more than looking at reference. You're also like analyzing it and understanding the mechanics of it. Am I wrong? Yeah, yeah definitely. Like when you... When you're looking at reference, you have to imagine why it is this way. So, for example, when you look at, when you look at, for example, the wing, I don't know if I have Mm -hmm. any side views of the wing. Yeah, so the bottom of the wing is flatter than the the top. So, the Mm -hmm. reason why that is, is because when the wind goes past it, it slides underneath the wing faster. Actually, is that it? Yeah. So, it's, if the wind goes underneath the, the wing faster than it goes over, and that's what forces aircraft to have lift. Mm-hmm. it's just things like that it's such a small simple thing but it makes the aircraft look more believable because the wing shape itself is based on a real aircraft yeah i didn't even notice that but i i totally get it now i yeah. see it now, now i can see it's part of the perception mm. so that's that's a big part of hard surface it's especially when you're doing something which doesn't exist it's about making it look like it should exist and to do that we look at the real world this is why it's so important to look especially when you're starting off to look at the real world if we were going to do like a i mean we do this all the time if we were going to destroy this plane and rip this wing off Mm -hmm. i immediately would look at reference of a crashed plane and just see how the metal tears and try and emulate that i wouldn't try and just make up how the metal is look like ripped if that makes sense Mm -hmm. totally when we are looking at say modelers or if if any of my people my environment guys are looking at vehicles and you know that starship is the sexy thing that's that's the woman in the red dress right (laughs) matrix style so is that what's important or do i need to go model some beetles and some some cars and model the camera and and things like that i think the modeling to camera thing is more Got important, it. but you can make that look sexy. Like, there's some really cool functional real world things out there. Fair enough. That's like, a good yeah. point. Like, for example, Lamborghini, for example. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty cool functional. I'll buy that. Exactly. So, that's the thing. Like, and if you look at like a real car engine, mm-hmm. it's so complex. Mm-hmm. And if you can make a photorealistic, really complex car engine, that's way more impressive to me than a spaceship which doesn't look functional, if that makes sense. It does. So that, that's some really cool stuff in the real world. You'd be surprised if, like, if people look around at what's around them. Like, even when I'm just walking through the street these days, I'll look at shapes of cars. And that's, a, that's a really nice looking car. Like, really well-respected designers design these cars. Yeah, there's so much beauty in the real world. So I don't think you have to make like a transformer to make your portfolio stand out. If that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Now. I don't know if this happens in VFX games with indie. It does, obviously. But is there any danger of people just going to the marketplace to buy these things instead of modeling them? Do you mean like for films? Yeah, for films. Well, the studios will always have budget to pay for it. So we don't usually have to worry about that sort of thing. Yeah, but I mean, at what point have we modeled everything in the world? (laughs) Oh, Every time it's always different. The amount of times I've... You get a Humvee and the, this Humvee on... Because the main thing is you have to model exactly... Say, for example, they built a Humvee on set. That Humvee might be very different. I mean, very slightly different to another Humvee. It might visually mm-hmm. look close, but yep. the model must match perfectly that one on set. So there's so many times we'll have to rebuild the same car because it must match what's on set. That makes sense. I get that. I was just reading a, an article about how a Unity, a 3D game engine Unity version of Notre Dame is is going to help them reconstruct it because the model oh, yeah. basically modeled the whole damn thing. And mm-hmm. they, had, they had it all in Assassin's Creed in the Unity version. You know, and, and it made me think, you know, it's like everything gets modeled. But that makes yeah. sense. You know, you, every, with film, it's very specific to that shot. Yeah, the amount of times the Humvee needs to be remodeled is pretty crazy. <laughs> every film has a Humvee or a Black Hawk in it. But if that Black Hawk looks slightly different, like the door is slightly different, to uh, you know, a Black Hawk in another film, we'll have to, we must match whatever's on, on set, especially if there's like camera takeovers from the CG to the real one. Mm-hmm. So it's very common to remodel like the same guns, the same sort of thing, because they might be very slightly different. 
That makes sense. I get it. All right. Unmar is asking, is it necessary to be on site for potential jobs? Do I need to go to LA, Vancouver in order to nail a job? And Unmar, you got to check out Andrew Hodgson's early part. You might have missed the conversation where it actually was necessary for him to go to London. I definitely think it makes, it definitely helps a lot. If you're in the area, like say, for example, if you can get yourself like an open working visa in Canada and you're physically in Canada, a studio can pick you up much easier. Like than trying to fly that's the thing if they if they have to relocate you they have to pay relocation fees Mm -hmm. so they don't really want to do that unless they know for a fact you'd be of a benefit to the company and if you're a junior with no experience it's hard to justify that so like being in the area definitely helps a lot that makes sense and not to mention they just don't know if you're a fit like i i remember one of my friends was hired over at blizzard and i mean they spent tens of thousands to send him yeah. And and he quit in three months. Damn. Yeah, pretty intense. Rexy is asking if your hard surface model and what do you use? Maya, Max, Blender? Uh, just Maya. Like say in VFX, Maya is the standard. We use Maya yeah. for everything. Well, modeling at least. What about Blender? No, I don't know any studios that use Blender really. At Maya, or well, for modeling at least, it's just Maya. Because the thing is, a lot of studios are built around a pipeline in Maya. Uh-huh. So... Rebuilding an entire pipeline for a different software is not usually worth it. Definitely. But, but Riley's saying shots are fired. <laughs> um, Maya's modeling tool set could, good. could use some, some help, yeah. you know, like a pet talk, agree. maybe. I agree. <laughs> so are you, I mean, I, you know, it gets much better because I know you can write code and plugins and all that stuff, make that stuff. Well, make I can't Maya. terrible with that stuff. I, I just <laughs> default Maya pretty much. No way, really? Yeah, I just use default Maya, but I have my own hotkeys. Good. But, <laughs> I but yeah, it. but this is the thing. Like, even though I'm doing all these cool spaceships and robots for you know Star Wars and stuff like that, I still mm-hmm. what I'm doing is not that. Like, I'm not the most technical person. Mm-hmm. It's all just polygon modeling. It's using the basic tools of Maya to make 3D object. So. The, the kind of the last thing I want to hit on this topic, because it's always a point of contention when we're doing hard surfaces, topology is a pain in the ass, right? It's, <laughs> and it's I like so it. much. <laughs> okay, good. That's So the pain in the ass part is obviously the, the clay sculptor in me talking. I'm like, I don't want to be thinking about that. I don't have to think about that in clay. So how do, what is your approach or how do you think about that? Because there's kit bashing where you just jam these things together. And yep. then there's the mid polygonal approach where you actually figure all of it out. How's it? How's it work for you? It's a bit of everything. Like, say for example, if you can kit bash, you should kit bash. Like, any time you can save is, you know, okay. I mean, say for example, like you look at like transformers, for example, like they are, they have a lot of kit bash parts. They're mostly automotive, like automotive parts which are pre-made. Mm-hmm. So manually modeling every single bolt would take way too long. But, I mean, those parts are usually made quite well anyway. But then, obviously, you do have to model whatever is custom. But I actually enjoy modeling, to be honest. I, like, the poly, like, and I know, I know a lot of people don't care about topology, but I really enjoy topology. It's, it's kind of like a puzzle. Like, how do I make this shape in a clean, efficient way? Mm-hmm. So I actually really, I actually really enjoy that side. I also enjoy UVs. A lot of people hate UVs, but I don't mind UVs, actually. <laughs> Yeah, I'm just gonna t- I'm gonna pause for a second to let that soak in. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. The thing that I love about UVs is the puzzle. Yeah, you know, piecing it together and cutting, sewing, getting it all to work. So I I get that, you know, and and it sounds like that's a big part of what makes you successful in hard surfaces. It's a big puzzle. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I totally see modeling as just a puzzle, and even the most most like because I I do these like basics of modeling things. So in these, I show like really basic things like how to do a corner, how to do, you know, T-shapes, stuff like this. But even the most basic, no, even the most advanced complex objects ever, it's just lots of these sorts of shapes put together. So I really enjoy building really complex shapes from lots of small, simple shapes, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. It's totally. just it's sort of problem solving. Like I, I really enjoy figuring out how to make a clean, efficient shape. Just uh, in game, hot surface. Oh, sorry, is that? In games, everything's triangles, but your workflow is very quad focused, right? Film yeah. needs to be quad. 
Yeah, film is, uh, it doesn't, well, everything should be quad. It's not like a hard rule. Like if you do have some triangles, it's not end of the world. Yeah. But everything being efficient is definitely a big plus. Okay. Clean what's, quads. what's the benefit of it being efficient? So I did a blog of this actually. Um, Fantastic. So, for example, so something that's done a lot in film is we'll do something called LODs, which is level of detail. So mm-hmm. we'll have like a high-res version, a mid-res version, and then a low-res version. So depending yeah. on how close it is to camera, that version gets used. So if you do – yeah, this is an example. If you do like a nice, clean, efficient model, it's much easier to down-res it, if that makes sense. Yes, that's 100%. I mean, that's the perfect reason. For why the quads? Because you obviously you can't down res a bunch of triangles. Yeah, exactly. You could decimate it further, but mm-hmm. that's not always a clean approach, and you exactly. can't get low poly like you can. Yep. Yeah. And also, yeah, if you do, it's it's much easier for the the texture artist to UV it as well mm-hmm. if it's done with quads. Okay, good, got it. All right, CAD programs like uh, Fusion three hundred and sixty. We don't use it at all. Okay. So, like, concepts, obviously, it's cool. But, yeah. yeah, we don't... In film, we're just doing production modeling. There's You can't really use CAD for production modeling. That's pretty much it. Okay. All right. And everything's pipeline. You know, yeah. I think, especially, I mean, at ILM, uh, they've been Maya-centric. God, long time, yeah? They do have some other software. I probably can't really talk too much about it. But um, yeah. a lot of studios do run through Maya. Yeah. That is the pretty standard one. I remember when I went to ILM was the very first place I ever trained ZBrush. Yeah. Very first place is I just got hired by Pixelogic. They actually fired me immediately after that month and and then hired me like a month later after I was, after I was top top Roman. But uh, that was my first job was ILM. I went up there and I trained uh, Carlos Fuentes, Andrew Cars, and then um, Sonny. Oh yeah. Uh, Jeff, Jeff. I don't remember Jeff's last name, but they're all still there except for Carlos. Nice. Yeah, that was fun. Yeah, Maya is just the industry standard. If you want to be a modeler in Maya, I mean, mm-hmm. a modeler in VFX, I would definitely suggest Maya. But some, it depends what discipline you want to get into. Like, I know some environment artists or generalists, they use Max. But as a generalist, it, it also depends on company because some generalists work out of the pipeline so they can use whatever they want. Right. Where... And as a modeler, we have to work in the pipeline. So it's usually Maya. Sometimes some people use Modo, but then Modo, that creates problems because you have to build your model in Modo and then export it, put it into Maya, then check it from Maya into the pipeline. So it's usually just easier to stay in Maya itself. All right, my friend. Well, Andrew, thank you so much for being here, for answering the questions and um, and for sharing your work and your wisdom. No worries, man. It was a good chat. All right, guys, thank you so much for being here. And um, if you got any questions, you know where to find Andrew, uh, right at rstation.com forward slash Andrew Hodgson, right in there. Yeah, right. anyone can send me a message. It's, it's totally cool. Congrats cool. on all the success. And uh, it's awesome looking at this. It's like all the just amazing, all the films I've seen recently. I love them. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> all right, all right take care. Take it easy. See you. you too. All right. So I want to thank you so much for being here, for taking the time and for listening to this podcast. And I want to ask a couple of things from you. Number one, make sure you leave a comment or you rate this on iTunes, Stitcher, wherever it is that you're getting this. That's going to make a big difference in helping us get the word out and get people to know who we are. All right. The other thing is I want to make sure you know where to find us. So you can head over to www.gameartinstitute.com where you can learn about our flagship program, which is the Game Artist Boot Camp. This, this is designed for those who are really looking to move the needle on their career and really lock in that job. You may have gone to school and learned a bunch, maybe haven't learned a bunch, But at the Game Art Institute, the primary focus we have is the very specific industry skills, the triggers that you really need to hit in that job interview. What are the specific things that they're looking for? That's what we're going to be training you on. We're taking applications right now for environment artists and for character artists. So make sure you head over to www.gameartinstitute.com and apply today. 
That way we can have that conversation, make sure this is a fit for you, make sure that you're a fit for it. And if everything is perfect, then we will sign you up for that right away and get you into your training and start moving the needle on your career. All right. Thank you so much again for being here. Take care. Have an amazing day.